Good morning, church. As we finish up passing the plates, I'm so grateful for your faithfulness to the gospel and the way that you give. Did you hear Susan say that it's lamb season in Guatemala, in Honduras? Did you hear that? That is called a ready-made sermon illustration right there, if lambs are being born around Christmas. You with me? Okay. The Apostle John said, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay. Isaiah 35. You have already heard it this morning, church. We gather each week this group of people, and I'm so grateful to have this conversation going on with you as we look throughout God's Word together. But bear in mind that this morning, this has never happened. This group of people around this passage of Scripture in this year, in this place, is new creation. And we read from one of God's prophets who was writing to a specific group of people experiencing new, hard creation in these moments. But Isaiah 35 is a breath of fresh air in an otherwise extremely difficult time. I don't know if you were aware Friday morning or out early. You didn't have to be out early to see it, but it was completely foggy uh, Friday morning. Visibility was a tenth of a mile at best if you were out driving. In 1952, a young uh, woman named Florence Chadwick stepped into the waters of the Pacific Ocean off of Catalina Island, determined to swim to the shore to the mainland in California. She'd already swam the English Channel both ways. She was an incredibly accomplished long-distance swimmer. But the weather on this particular day was very chilly, and even more foggy. She could hardly see the boats that were with her. She had a traveling party and boats to care for her just in case something happened, but she could barely even see them going along right beside her. Still, she persevered and she swam for 15 hours. Can you imagine? When she begged to be taken out of the water along the way. Her mother, who was in a boat alongside her, told her she was so close, told her that she could could make it if she just kept going. But, But finally, physically and emotionally exhausted, she stopped swimming and she was pulled out. And it wasn't until she was on the boat and being consoled and warmed and comforted that she discovered the shore was less than a half mile away. And at a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see, all I could see was fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have had enough left to continue until I made it. You know, hearing Isaiah 35 this morning, um, well, set in a rather long book, 60 some chapters, Isaiah had a lot to say. Uh, the, the book overall seems to address in, in different sections and in various ways the, the great, great struggle that God's people uh, existing in the time that Isaiah wrote as a divided kingdom, north and south, that the great struggle they had with all of their sorry kings that they selected and their poor leadership along the way that ultimately led to nations empires like Assyria and Babylon being able to, to overcome them. It's sometimes difficult to, to place what Isaiah, where, where, wherever you are in Isaiah, uh, with the exact time period that he is speaking in. We think we know when Isaiah lived, but, but the book seems to address Israel's struggle for a couple of hundred years which is interesting. And of course, this brings in a whole host of interesting questions about authorship and who may have helped Isaiah put down what we find and and still read in our new creation efforts today. But the whole book is, is categorizing the struggle, but also giving reason, according to Isaiah, to hope 
within it. A grieving, distressed, struggling Hebrew people who still have every reason to, as we have said in a variety of very effective ways this morning, rejoice. The people that Isaiah is addressing are in so many ways, as Florence Chadwick was, physically and emotionally exhausted, even though they brought a lot of it on themselves. But this chapter that we read during the prayer time, this chapter is a light coming out of the doldrums of chapter 34 and other chapters like it. Its central message is a promise, is the promise that God will ultimately bring God's people to the land of promise when all will be well. Now let's stop right there for a moment this morning because there's a whole host of things as Oksana said so well that I could think of or that could be the reason or a reason that you may have kind of drug in here this morning a bit. Maybe you're staggering. Maybe you have shaking knees as our text reads. If not physically, perhaps it is mentally this morning. Do the gifts that you would like to buy for loved ones this, this season, do they exceed the capacity of your bank account? Been there. I understand that. Then there's the onslaught of local and national and global news that we're faced with every day. And whether or not, church, you believe that the circumstances in the world are, are getting more dire, when I read books of the Bible like Isaiah, I'm, I'm, I lean the other way. Things have always been dire. People have always been prone to wonder. But whether or not you think things are getting worse, at the very least, we have more access, unlimited access to all the bad, all the salacious stories that there are to tell. And those stories seem to be the stories that we like to tell the most, sadly. Bad news abounds. You do not have to look far to see it. I have to admit, I'm extremely lucky and it you know, comes into focus this time of year because I, I've we've always had people to, to be with Thanksgiving and Christmas. We've, we have families that like to get together and do so throughout the year. And, and there's just not really any angst around the holidays other than your average run of the mill angst that I create a lot of, but our family loves each other. And that may not be the case for you this morning. Your situation may be entirely different. There may not be a great amount of joy in the forecast for you over the next couple of weeks. It's for reasons such as these that Isaiah chapter 35 needs to be read and reread. Look back at verse one with me. The wilderness, the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a wildflower. I don't know if you've been to the desert, but that is borderline miraculous to blossom like a wildflower, to blossom abundantly, as verse 2 says, and will also rejoice with joy and singing. So understand this, church. This is, this is why we gather and sing. The church didn't always sing when they gathered for worship. It wasn't a few, till a few centuries later. Did you know that? How do we get that wrong for so long? It was right here. This is what we're supposed to do in our gathering. We gather and sing. And you know what? The struggle in our lives, the wilderness, if you're catching the metaphor in the text, the, the struggle in our lives, it, it, you know what it allows for? Now, I'm not trying to make light of it or dismiss it. I'm not trying to, to categorize your suffering as, as from God, as if you're supposed to, to, to suffer all of the time. Not at all. But that struggle that we go through, and you heard it this morning in our testimonies. You heard Julie say it much better than I could. That struggle we will all go through in varying degrees from time to time, it allows us to stagger in here together and to lift our voices. We have a reason to, to rejoice and sing. And we profess with our joyful singing that, that we know this pain, as Julie reminded us, will not last 
forever. And our joyful singing, your joyful singing, it helps me to believe it even more. Look at verse three. Strengthen the weak hands and steady the shaking knees. First sermon I ever preached, my right knee shook for 25 minutes. It was very concerning. I was nervous. Steady the shaking knees. Say to the cowardly, be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God. Vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. Church, let these words encourage you this morning. You, you who, who may be weak, take strength. You who may be full of fear, take courage. Are, are you shaky? Are you, are you weak need this morning? Stand firm. If anyone, if anyone could have succumbed to the fear, like our swimmer did off of Catalina Island, it would have been the young girl, Mary, called, called to give birth, a, a virgin to the baby boy, Jesus, who, who would be, as the angel said, the, the one the Hebrew people had waited and longed for for as long as they could remember since, since the days of Abraham. This baby boy deemed Messiah. He will save you. Luke chapter 1. Luke offers to us Mary's response to this news. You may be familiar with it, but it's good to be reminded of it this time of year. Here's what she said. Mary said, my, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. The young girl Mary speaks with confidence about, about her own situation, a, a servant girl who is lowly and meek, but, but lifted high and given the most important calling ever. Fraught with intense struggle, she embraces this calling and, and, and offers the strongest testimony of faith in the midst of the most difficult call to faith that I can imagine. Look back at our text in Isaiah 35 at verse five, verses 5 and 6. Then, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped, then the lame will leap like a deer. The, the tongue of the mute sing for joy, for, for water will gush in the wilderness and, and streams in the desert. I get excited when the text speaks of water in the wilderness and streams in the desert because while I haven't been uh, to the Middle East yet, I hope to someday soon. I have, my dad and my brother have, and I've told you about the wadis that I've read about and seen pictures of, but it actually rains a lot in the mountain regions and around the desert. And when intense storms come, much like the rain we had Thursday morning, which was so intense, the water rains heavily in the mountains and it rushes fast down into the desert. And these wadis develop where all the water goes into a stream. And it's around these streams that vegetation actually can grow. And it's around these streams that when shepherds lead their sheep on a journey and they're in the desert regions and they don't have much to eat, they look for these wadis 
so that they can find food for the sheep. Abundantly growing along these streams of water, but it's not without difficulty or danger because when you hear King David in the Psalms talking about having his feeling like his feet are stuck in the mud, he is imagining these wadis because when they're not flowing with water, they can be quite sticky and you can get your feet stuck in the mud and it can become dangerous for the sheep when they do. Very interesting circumstances around the wadis and how scripture reveals what our lives are like and what God, the great shepherd, is like. Those hearing these words that Isaiah is writing, they're they're captives of a brutal war. If we believe it's in the exilic period of the Babylonian captivity, which I think makes sense for chapter 35 here. They're captives of a brutal war, a takeover. They're, they're wounded, they're injured. They're, many of them, uh, history teaches us, their eyes have been intentionally gouged out or intentionally blinded. And these are, in fact, the marks of war. And you know as well as I do, this part of the world, places in the Middle East, they see so much war and have throughout the years. All the world does, but particularly concentrated in that region. And, you know, currently it's, it's somewhat west of that. Oksana's extended family dealing with the great war in Ukraine right now. We pray for them, but think about it. Think about how quick things can be out of sight, out of mind for us over here in the West. It was a little over a year ago we were extremely concerned about Afghanistan. We still should be. Five years ago or so, I've, 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 I've never felt like I felt reading stories about refugees coming out of Syria when Assad was in power and what was happening in that region. I watched a movie recently called The Swimmers, which detailed, yes, it was a, a creation, but fiction, but showed what some of the circumstances for a refugee fleeing a war-torn country would be and incredible circumstances that so often involved a, a, a rickety raft across oceanic water. These are the marks of war and they, they affect changed lives so much. They, they seek to, to kill and destroy. These are the marks of war. What are the marks of restoration? I'll offer to you a part of Jesus's life and ministry from Matthew 15 to to explain what the marks of restoration are. Starting in verse 29, he, he says, moving on from there, Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee and he He went up on a mountain and sat there and large crowds came to him, including the lame, the blind, the crippled, those unable to speak and, and many others. These are the folks described in Isaiah 35, by the way. And they put them at his feet and he healed them. So the crowd was amazed when they saw those unable to to speak, talking, the the crippled restored, the, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they gave glory to the God of Israel. Church, are you following and being formed by this Jesus this morning? The one that Mary birthed, the one who came to save, because these are the things we should be seeing. These are the things we should be helping with. (laughs) I was thinking about my kids reminding me that sometimes I'll say many hands make light work when I'm trying to get our family behind something to get it done more quickly. I don't know if you noticed Susan saying it will take less than 10 minutes today to pack all of those boxes and And we run the risk in such a short time, even though it is beautiful to see many hands making work light, we run the risk of not fully capturing exactly what we are doing. We are living into these three verses in Matthew 15. We are living out what is being described in Isaiah 35. We are following and being formed by Jesus in the ways that allows us to see this taking place right now. This is what the marks of restoration look like. And we should be seeing them 
along the way as we follow Jesus. Look at verses 8 through 10. Because there's a way, a road that we should be on together that we are. A road will be there in a way. It'll be called the holy way. The unclean will not travel on it. But it will be for the one who walks the path. Fools will not wander on it. There will be no lion there. No vicious beast will go up on it. They won't be found there. But the redeemed will walk on it. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come to Zion singing, crowned with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee. These last few verses, Isaiah describes a highway through the wilderness. And you know, we know there will be hard times on this journey. That is precisely the wilderness when, when things are rocky and, and difficult. The refugees struggle out of Syria and so many other places in the world is so intense. In that movie I watched, it was so evident to see that those refugees fleeing together would not have made it without one another. That is an apt analogy to our lives as followers of Jesus. Together, we are able to travel in safety and confidence through the wilderness. There will be days when we feel so parched, so dry, but streams, church, do come in the desert. And this is the good news for us during Advent, precisely that it won't always be like this. And we when we know and when we have confidence in where all of this is heading and how God will ultimately finish what God has started, the wilderness, as Julie again so beautifully described, it becomes not a journey of struggle, but it allows for joy. It becomes not a journey of struggle primarily, but a journey of hope for what is to come and, and even that joy in our imagination of what is to come and our seeing glimpses of it even now, these glimpses are the marks of restoration. And these marks of restoration, they don't count as check marks on our cosmic scorecard, church. The marks of restoration serve to show people what God is like, what God's world is could be like in order that they may look to Jesus alone for salvation and then begin to follow him and continually be formed by him. Our text reminds us that not all will be on this road. And that is a worthy thing to acknowledge, church. If you're here this morning and you have never said yes to Jesus as Lord, I don't believe you're on that road yet. But let me tell you what I also believe, that God wants you there. And I believe that I pastor a church who believes that as well that there is no greater joy for the people in these pews than for one who is lost to be found. For one who is in the weeds next to the road to untangle themselves from the weeds and join us on the road. We don't always do well on the road. We are pathetic at times, but it's a better place to be. It's actually the only place to be because the king, the baby whom we will celebrate in a couple of weeks being born, is just ahead of us. And we're following him. And the shore is not that far away, y'all. Despite the fog, we must keep swimming. We must help each other keep swimming. Let's pray. God, thank you for Isaiah the prophet 
who understood um, in an incredible way the plans you have for your people, the plans that you will not abandon, the plans that include anyone who ultimately says yes to following and being formed by your son, Jesus. I pray this morning that we would say yes. Whether it's again or the first time that we would say yes. Joy is found nowhere else. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.